Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas Hawkin, and I'm a guide at the Russell Coates Art Gallery and Museum. Now today, I'm very happy to be able to tell you a bit about one of my favorite paintings. It's called Life at the Seaside or Ramsgate Sands. If you look at the screen, you'll see uh, words from a popular song, which I'm sure you all know. Oh, I do like to be beside the seaside. I do like to be beside the sea. I'm not going to sing it for fear of bringing on uh, some ghastly storm. But I will ask you to think a little bit about being beside the sea. Today's painting celebrates life at the seaside, but it actually in the middle of the Victorian period in 1854. We have to ask the question, what is it that we like about the seaside? Why do we like to be beside the sea? Well, obviously some of the, there are many reasons, but some of them would include relaxation, fun, the possibility of friendships or romance, long walks or swimming, and of course, to breathe in the fresh air and to have an unlimited horizon, a vast horizon. What is a beach? Well, I've been thinking about what the beach represents. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live in Bournemouth. I live only about five minutes away from a beach in Westbourne. And the sum total of my thinking has been that the beach is an ambiguous place. Uh, it's a place where two basic elements, the land and the water, meet and merge under a third element, which is the air. If you think about it, invasions have been launched from beaches. Invaders have landed on beaches. Castaways have come ashore on beaches. Think of Robinson Crusoe. And people have fled for their lives from beaches. Today's painting stresses calmness and family life. There's no hint of vice or corruption. It's all very peaceful and actually, I think, very lovely. It celebrates also a common purpose. So here it is. William Powell Frith, 1854, Life at the Seaside, or as it's known more commonly today, Ramsgate Sands. I shall refer to it mostly as Life at the Seaside because that is what's that was the original title when it was exhibited in 1854, and it's what's actually inscribed on the back of the painting. Now, this was Frith's first modern life panorama. I'll tell you a bit more about the others later on. If you boil it down to its essential elements, you've got a skyline, and we can see recognizable structures on the beach in Ramsgate. We see a crowd of people uh, on East Cliff Beach and a beach which is, as I said before, a place that is somewhat enigmatic. Now you will be seeing the painting several times and I'll also be taking you into the painting in close-up. And at the end, I shall suggest a way in which you yourselves, when, when you have a bit of time, uh, can go into the painting in close up yourselves and look at all the various details. But there it is. There's the first time we're seeing it. And uh, it is a crowd of people on a beach in 1854. Now, in the next couple of pages or so, I'm going to give you a brief biography of William Powell Frith. I'm not doing a talk 
uh, on William Fowle Frith. I'm doing a talk on one of his paintings, in fact, the painting that launched his career. It was exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition in 1854. Technically, if you're interested in that, it's oil on canvas, not particularly big, it's 36 by 61 inches. The Royal Academy Summer Exhibition of 1854 was actually the 86th Summer Exhibition. Now, Frith was born in Yorkshire, uh, near Ripon, in 1819. His father was the proprietor of the Dragon Hotel in Harrogate, and he urged his son, William, to take up art. Frith actually wanted to be an auctioneer. Now, this is quite unusual. Normally, what you have is a child who wants to be an artist and parents who say, oh, no, no, you must do something rather more serious. Here we have it going the other way around. <laughs> so in 1835, um, at the insistence of his father, Frith, and his father traveled to London. Frith was then 16. He attended Sass's Academy and the RA schools. In fact, the deal when they went to London was that uh, Frith's drawings would be shown to some artists, and if they thought that he would study to be an artist. Luckily, the judgment was that he did have talent, and so he attended these, this academy and the RA schools. Now, on the left, you see Frith when he was in, uh, probably in his early 20s. Uh, you have a self-portrait of him in the middle. There he is, aged 63. And then later in life, age 79, on the right. Now, the clique. The clique was a group of friends, they were all artists, who gathered in the late 1830s and early 1840s. Um, here you have their names. They had a particular philosophy, if you like. They believed that art should be judged by the people that it should not conform to any prescribed ideals, and that at regular meetings, the members would all draw the same subject. And this would be judged by a non-artist in attendance. This was very important. Now here on the right, you see a gentleman that I'm sure all of you will recognize. And I'm going to uh, show you here a letter that he wrote to Frith in 1842. My dear sir, I shall be very glad if you will do me the favor to paint me two little companion pictures. One, a Dolly Varden, whom you have so exquisitely done already. The other, a Kate Nickleby. Faithfully yours always, Charles Dickens, dated early 1842. Now, Frith was delighted to receive this letter from Charles Dickens, and it marked, in fact, the beginning of a lifelong friendship. At the time of the receipt of this letter, Dickens was 30, Frith seven years younger, Frith was 23. Now we have to ask why is Dickens important in Frith's development? Well, it's interesting to know that at the time people would read paintings. And I use the verb read advisedly because they would move across the canvas as if they were going from line to line and page to page. So in the 1840s, Frith was commissioned by Dickens, and very importantly, he began to read Dickens's novels. They became friends, and Frith was immensely influenced by the author's ability to show real life and the variety of life in his writing. 
A quotation from Frith, weary of costume painting, I had determined to try my hand on modern life with all its drawbacks of unpicturesque dress. Here we have, from 1859, Frith's portrait of Charles Dickens. I think it's rather good. Apparently Dick Dickens didn't think so himself. The, the portrait was commissioned by John Forster, who was a friend of Dickens and also his biographer. Forster was delighted with this painting. Dickens less so. Frith at the time would have been aged 40. Uh, on the desk you see the first few pages of Dickens' 12th novel, A Tale of Two Cities. Now, following his career and the development of his career, in 1845, Frith was 26, he became an associate of the Royal Academy and he married Isabel. In April 1846, the railway reached Ramsgate. In 1851, we find Frith in Ramsgate on holiday with his family. He started sketching holiday makers on the beach. He was drawn to what he saw. In the summer of 1852, we know that he was drawing in buildings and background. In 1853, Frith was elected a full RA, and he started an affair with Mary Alford. Now you'll hear more about Mary Alford later. When in 1853, Frith was elected a full RA, he actually filled the place that had been vacated by Turner. So he was filling uh, an important place there at the Royal Academy. In 1854, Life at the Seaside was exhibited at the Royal Academy and bought at that time. Frith was then 35 years old. Now models were very important, not just to Frith, but to artists at that time. Frith used his family as models, friends, people he saw in the street, people he thought looked interesting, people from the workhouse even, and professional models. It was always a concern for Frith to find the right model, uh, the right face for the right role. That was it, a model who fit. In 1853 to 1854, in the studio, Frith starts putting drawings to canvas, using posed live models for all the front figures, mostly women, incidentally. What was Frith's genius? Uh, it's generally agreed that he was a genius in his original conception and also in the arrangement and the placing of the figures. Um, this is what he said uh, about Ramsgate Sands at the time. The variety of character on Ramsgate Sands attracted me. All sorts and conditions of men and women were there. Pretty groups of ladies were to be found, reading, idling, working, and unconsciously forming themselves into very paintable compositions. This is a quotation drawn from uh, Fritz's autobiography called My Autobiography and Reminiscences, 1887, hugely popular when it came out. Now, on working uh, at uh, Life at the Seaside, Frith was worried. He's only just been elected uh, an RA, and he really had a few doubts about what he was doing. Will all this repay me in any way? I doubt it. That's from his diary in 1853. Uh, rumors were circulating in the Royal Academy, the creation of something new and modern. Not everyone accepted this. An early academician apparently said, 
Oh, this comes of electing fellows too hastily. I suppose there are always critics, aren't there? But a senior RA, William Mulready, was also critical. He said the colours were too muted. This depressed Frith, but his friends and fellow artists, Egg and John Leach, supported him. Now, I wanted to show you something that Frith was also working on uh, in 1853, as he was preparing Life at the Seaside. It's called The Sleepy Model, and it's Frith's diploma work. When you're elected to the Royal Academy, you have to present the Academy with one of your paintings, which they will then put away as your diploma work. This is interesting because Frith decided to paint a girl, uh, an orange selling girl. She was asked to pose, <laughs> but she fell asleep. So in the painting uh, that Frith is standing in front of, you see her while she was awake. But then in the finished painting, you see her with her head tilted over. Poor girl, she's fallen fast asleep with her basket of oranges just, to the, just on the floor beside her. Now on show Sunday, which was when the artists would invite people to their studio, to look at what they were doing. Frith had many visitors, but he was still nervous. On the whole, feel the picture is thought successful. Cannot tell, it may be the reverse. This is from his diary. However, at the private view of the 1854 Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, he writes this, April the 28th, Drove to the Royal Academy at a quarter to 12. The Royal Family came. The Queen, delighted with Seaside, wanted to buy it, found she couldn't. Everybody likes it. That's quoted by Christopher Wood, who's written uh, the only biography of William Powell Frith. So, the Royal Academy in 1854, the Summer Exhibition in 1854, uh, went from the 1st of May to the 22nd of July. Now, astonishingly, and I suppose a great relief to Frith, it was a tremendous success. Most friends and artists and people in the Academy praised life at the seaside. The public reaction was extremely positive. People loved the fascinating new subject matter. Here was the life of ordinary people. Here were Victorians looking at themselves represented in a painting. Viewers in an art gallery or looking at a print could instantly recognize themselves and their world. Crowds, enormous crowds formed around the painting. Uh, a railing had to be placed in front of the painting to protect it. This actually happened on several occasions to Frith's paintings at the Royal Academy. Now, if we look at how the painting was actually sold. First of all, it was rejected by several private buyers but an art dealer called Lloyd bought Life at the Seaside for a thousand guineas. Queen Victoria, as we've heard, expressed the desire to own it. Uh, I suppose when Queen Victoria wanted something, you pretty much had to give it to her because Lloyd sold the painting to the Queen for a thousand guineas. Today, incidentally, that would be half a million pounds. But there were conditions. Lloyd asked to borrow the painting for engraving purposes. I believe it was actually three years they wanted it for. And they asked, secondly, to retain all profit, profits from resulting sales of prints. The conditions were met by Buckingham Palace. This was an extremely lucrative deal 
for Lloyd. Uh, the plate was engraved by a man called D.W. Sharp, well-known line engraver, and then sold to the art union for 3,000 pounds. For the Queen, life at the seaside was a pleasant reminder of happy holidays in Ramsgate. She stayed in our place called Albion House, which you will be seeing soon, uh, between the ages of six to 17, with her mother, the Duchess of Kent. Now, you'll be seeing very soon some close-up views. But first, we must ask, how was life at the seaside covered by the critics? Well, the Athenaeum, the Times, and Punch were all very positive. The art journal said, here it is, and every year it will become more valuable as a memento of the habits and manners of the English at the seaside in the middle of the 19th century. It was in fact voted picture of the year by the journal Royal Academy Pictures. Now we're starting our close-up views. Uh, we're on the left of the painting. Uh, <coughs> in the extreme left corner, you see the clock tower. Uh, then uh, next to the obelisk, or actually behind the obelisk, you see the Royal Hotel. Further down, and here, we see a, a group of black musicians who are performing. They are just some of the people who are working the beach. It was, the beach didn't only have holiday makers on it, there were people there actually trying to make a bit of money. So uh, the, these black musicians would perform and then presumably they would walk around and pass the hat. There's a man down here with a telescope, that was quite a popular thing for men to do. Uh, and as we move across, there's the obelisk, which was put up for George IV's visit to Ramsgate in 1821. Uh, slightly to the right of the obelisk, we have the committee rooms of Ramsgate Harbour trustees. In front of the committee rooms is, a, is Pier Yard. Uh, and then there's Pier Castle. Today, I'm sad to say, a fish and chip shop. In the front, Kent Terrace, and right behind that and looming over East Cliff Beach is Albion House. Today it's the Albion Hotel, but it was between 1825 and 1836 that Queen Victoria and her mother stayed at Albion House. So this place, Ramsgate, the coast at Ramsgate, had a very personal significance for the Queen. Now at the water's edge, we have a young lady leaning over a child. This is assumed to be Isabel Frith, uh, William Powell Frith's wife. The lady just next to them may be a relative, may be a sister, uh, we don't know. But off to the left here is a rather humorous little vignette. There's a man kneeling on the sand and showing a lady some sort of little curio or memento perhaps of Ramsgate. The lady doesn't look as if she's in, in any way inclined to buy it. <laughs> in fact, she looks rather annoyed. The man reading the newspaper was a friend of Frith uh, called Richard Llewellyn. And I particularly like this couple here. The lady has her eyes closed. She's being shielded from the sun by her companion, who may be her husband, who may be her lover, who may be her coachman. We don't know, but they look fairly well off. And this leads me to say something about the sort of people that you find in this painting on the beach. It was a democratic place. Everyone and anyone could gather there. 
which I think is rather nice because we think of the Victorians as being so class conscious and a society completely stratified. Now this gentleman, if you look at the arrow, this gentleman also kneeling on the sand has in front of him, and you, if you look at the arrow, you'll see those two little figures. Those are performing white mice. And the ladies that he's uh, showing his little mice to, several of them have already, this one in particular, have already been captivated. Notice also their crinolines. People sometimes look at this painting and say, gosh, uh, don't people look, doesn't it look very crowded on that beach? Well, don't forget that with crinolines, with large skirts such as these, you don't see the distance between people, which gives an impression of overcrowding. Here we have another gentleman with a telescope. And I will tell you that I think their telescopes were not only used to look at the seagulls. <laughs> Here's a gentleman just lounging on the beach, no easy chairs, nothing like that, no one lying on the sand really, and everyone fully dressed. This is an interesting uh, group uh, down at the bottom of the right, right hand side of the painting. This young lady holding a parasol uh, with a child in front of her, this young lady was apparently modeled by Mary Alford. Now Mary Alford was originally taken into Frith's home and Frith became her ward. Now, I'm sorry, I don't mean to scandalize you, but uh, Frith and Mary evidently became lovers. Uh, she was then his mistress. And uh, when Isabel died later on, Frith actually married Mary Alford. Here we have peeping out between the two men a little portrait of Frith himself at the age of 35. In the background we have a Mr. Gwillem. You see him here in a top hat. It's not that that clear but he's actually got in front of him a performing hare which bangs a tambourine. <laughs> he had a number of animals and he would go to the beach and uh, obviously put on a little show, charge people for watching, pass the hat, that sort of thing. Another of the people who's working the beach. There, another aspect of the, uh, well, another commercial aspect of the beach at Ramsgate was that there were not just donkeys, you can see back here, but also uh, bathing machines, which were to preserve uh, ladies' modesty. Bathing machines became very popular. Here is a, a popular postcard <laughs> called, um, I can't read it very well, but it says, Mermaids of Brighton, that's right. And it shows you how the uh, bathing machine worked. You see back here, there are people, it was either people pushing the bathing machine into the shallow water. Sometimes a horse would do it. Ladies would get into the bathing machine from the other side, get changed, and then walk down into the water. Or they were lowered down into the water by special ladies who would car carry them or actually pull them through the water. The, the, the idea was not to swim, you see. The idea was to take the sea water, to, to get the benefit of the sea water. Now I'd like to uh, try a little theatrical comparison here with you. Here is uh, Life at the Seaside again. I began to think as I looked more and more at this painting, that the beach, as we see it here, almost resembles a stage. 
The skyline that you see in the back is the backdrop. The tourists, the people on the beach are the actors and actresses. The shallow water is the stalls where we, the public, would be sitting. And that makes us, in a sense, part of the audience. The British seaside uh, at this time, uh, well, as soon as the railways started opening up, they became popular holiday destinations. Uh, the railway started moving across the country uh, in all directions in the 1840s. And now anyone could travel to the beach. It's very important to realize that. Victorian society, as I've said before, very clear class distinctions, but oddly enough, and it is strange, the beach was a neutral environment. All kinds of people gathered together there. It was not a place that was partitioned by class. Now, the painting you see at the top here is the final version from 1854, but I'd like to draw your attention to the sketch that Frith made, <coughs> excuse me, the year before. Now, if you look carefully, look at the two arrows. In the, the final version, as we've seen before, we have Mary Alford here, we have Frith peeping out, and a couple of gentlemen and a little girl. But down here, in the last sketch, we have a completely different scene. We have just three gentlemen. I was intrigued by this and I, I began to look into it. And it seems to me, and this is only my theory, it seems to me that this was the time when Frith started his affair with Mary Alford. So I think that at the last moment, he decided to eliminate this group of gentlemen and instead as a sort of secret homage or nod to Mary Alford, he included her here in the picture. I know very well that I never was, nor under any circumstances could have become a great artist, but I am a very successful one. This is taken, another quotation taken from William Powell Fritz, my autobiography and reminiscences. It's not a book that's easily available. I had to get Bournemouth Library to send it down from the library uh, in London. But I was able at least, uh, it's three volumes. I didn't read all of it and I wouldn't pretend I did. But um, it's definitely worth looking at if you're ever in London and can get to the library there. So we have to ask, was Frith true to the ideals of his school, schoolboy almost clique. Was he, was he true to those ideals? Well, his paintings were judged by the people and the people loved them. His multi-figure panoramas, starting with Life at the Seaside, broke new ground in showing the diversity of mid-Victorian social life. People were captivated by these multi-figure panoramas. Here's a quotation from Jeremy Paxman's book, The Victorians. There was also a TV, uh, it's a companion actually to the TV programs he made on the Victorians. He says, it was real life and understood by any spectator of the time as real life, reflecting the texture and facts of their own experience. But this way, life at the seaside was revolutionary. In fact, today, Frith is considered to be the most important painter of the social scene since Hogarth. Now, a little bit about the people themselves on Ramsgate Sands. What were the Victorian priorities? Well, Sea air was important, breathing it in, good health. Don't forget this was the Industrial Revolution. 
A lot of the cities would have been very polluted. Suddenly you're at the coast, you're breathing in lovely, lovely, clean, fresh air. Must have been amazing. And as we said before, seawater was thought to be really good for you. Uh, sitting, floating or lying in the water rather than swimming. And of course, ladies used bathing machines which were designed for modesty. In fact, the men, if they swam, would swim further up the beach, completely naked. More than any other artist, it was Frith who created the Vogue for paintings of modern life. He still has not had the credit for being the first of the, of the European artists to paint large groups of people in modern dress engaged in ordinary everyday activities. In fact, Frith was doing this well before the French Impressionists. And of course, they are often credited with inventing the modern life picture. And this comes from Christopher Wood's biography of Frith. Manet wasn't doing modern life pictures until 1862 with music in the Tuileries Gardens. And both Degas and Renoir were doing modern life paintings later in, 18, in the 1860s and 1870s. Now I said that Ramsgate Sands or Life at the Seaside was an important uh, multi-figure panorama and it did in fact pave the way for further frith panoramas. Four years later we had Derby Day, which is today at the Tate, Railway Station, which is at the Royal Holloway College, four years after that, and then the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales, 1863, a royal uh, collection and a royal uh, commissioned actually by the Queen. That was in 1865. And the last one, a private view at the Royal Academy, 1881, painted in 1883. This is privately owned by the Pope family. So looking at Frith, there he is posed in front of one of his canvases. Uh, what he's holding uh, in his hand is what's called a Mao stick. It's a way of securing the painting, the painter's hand, so that detail can be painted very exactly. He could paint normal family values, while at the same time running two households a mile apart. He spent his time painting, exhibiting, writing, a three-volume autobiography, uh, also a biography of his friend John Leach, who worked for Punch, mixing in the art world. He was very well known, very popular, an amusing Yorkshireman. And at the same time, he was juggling a wife, a mistress, and 19 children. It, it does seem quite extraordinary, really. 12 children with Isabel, and seven with Mary Alford. Paintings uh, in the 1850s and later were, I think it's important for us to realize, they were very special and very important. Today we all have so many images around us where we're suffused with images. The Victorians didn't have this. Uh, the paintings of the time were effectively like today's TV programs, films and documentaries. It was the way people got knowledge and information. They got their history, their geography, their fables. All of that came from the paintings. Paintings by established artists were viewed by literally hundreds of thousands of people in traveling exhibitions. They were enormously popular. To give you an example, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition of 1879, there were 391,000 visitors in eight weeks. That's 48,000 per week and almost 7,000 per day. It's quite astonishing. In 1880, Isabel dies. 
The year after that, Frith marries Mary Alford. And 14 years later, in 1895, Mary Alford dies. Frith uh, was made a commander of the Victorian order by Edward VII on his 89th birthday. It's interesting that Queen Victoria, who died in 1901, never knighted William Powell Frith. She must have heard about his rather, uh, how can I put it, different uh, marital situation and uh, perhaps was shocked by that. But her son decided to commemorate Frith uh, and made him a commander of the Victorian order. Frith actually died in January 1909, just before his 91st birthday. This is from Christopher Wood's biography. One can understand why Queen Victoria preferred life at the seaside to Frith's later modern life pictures. It is mainly about family life. It is full of women and children and an air of happy domesticity hangs over it. There is no hint of vice or crime. It's a Victorian domestic genre painting taken out of doors and onto the beach. Now, here is my recommendation. There are two ways you can see life at the seaside close up. First of all, if you have an access to uh, a computer, which I'm assuming you do, uh, put into Google Frith Royal Collection. The first site that comes up uh, will bring you life at the seaside. But if you want to go close up, click on the little plus sign, which is in the bottom left hand corner. Rotate the little wheel on your mouse and move around the painting in close up. It's, um, it's a really good way to look at the painting. And we have that possibility by going to the Royal Collection site. You can also move the image around horizontally or vertically. Well worth doing for a close look. Alternatively, and uh, here I may be biased, I would recommend that you visit the Russell Coates and see the version that Frith painted in 1905 for the museum. In 1905, Sir Merton Russell Coates bought a replica made by Frith of his original painting of Life at the Seaside. Frith was 86 years old at the time, and he did this 51 years after the original was exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition of 1854. The painting is hanging in the dining room. <coughs> Excuse me. Well worth doing for a close up look at life at the seaside itself. I've uh, outlined here my sources so that you can see what, what the sources I've used for this talk. Uh, you've got uh, obviously the only biography at the top by Christopher Wood, then uh, book, various different books uh, that I have been able to use and which have been very helpful. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be very happy now to answer any questions that you may have.